Go. Meeting is being recorded. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Um, my name is April Dawson and I am the executive director of the California Commission on Disability Access and I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. I am a white woman wearing a black, red and gold leaf shirt and I have short uh, short strawberry blonde hair with some gray, gray streaks. And I'm a wheelchair user, which you may not be able to see on the Zoom. Uh, the, California the California Commission on Disability Access's mission is to increase disability access across California through dialogue and collaboration with stakeholders, including but not limited to the disability and business communities, as well as all levels of government. Uh, for short, we're called the CCDA. And the CCDA educates businesses about disability access compliance through technical materials, webinars, and locally focused forums. Tonight's webinar, Disability Access and Grants for Small Businesses, is a follow-up to the in-person listening forum that was held on August 31st at San Jose City Hall. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Rania Mosen, who is the Disability Affairs Officer for the City of San Jose, and the co-sponsor for this evening's webinar. Rania? Thank you, April. Welcome, everybody. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Uh, as April mentioned, my name is Rania Mosen. I have uh, dark brown hair, fair skin with an olive undertone. I'm wearing a mauve sweater and dress and consider myself an ally in my role as Disability Affairs Officer for the City of San Jose. As April mentioned, we are here today to share resources and education about removing barriers and ensuring everyone, including people with disabilities, have access to our spaces. Disability inclusion and improving accessibility is a priority for San Jose, as directed by our City Council. The City Council recently adopted a disability inclusion equity pledge and formalized our commitment to a barrier-free environment. We understand that our small businesses have had some challenges with meeting the requirements of disability access laws. And this has often led to lawsuits and sometimes closure, particularly if businesses do not have the funds to cover legal costs and necessary improvements. To address these challenges, the city has created and launched a pilot grant program that provides funding upfront to make accessibility and construction improvements. This program was created in response to input from business owners and as an effort to balance the needs of people with disabilities and support for our small businesses. Juan Borelli from our Small Business Ally program is here with us today and will be sharing some information about this program and how to apply a little bit later. And today, though we will be talking primarily about physical access, um, please note that access also refers to other areas of business, such as digital content. For example, our websites and social media need to be accessible for people that use screen readers or other assistive technologies. Access is important because it, it's, it represents inclusion and people with disabilities make up nearly 25% of our population. It is good for business to be accessible because it ensures that everyone has access to products and services. It increases the number of customers and creates a more welcoming community and neighborhood. And I'll hand it off back to you, April. Thank you, Rania. Before I review the agenda and introduce tonight's speakers, I am going to turn it over to CCDA's operations manager, Phil McFall, who is going to give an overview of the accessibility features of Zoom and tips for keeping access at the forefront of the evening. Phil? Thank you, April. Um, yes, my name is Phil McFall. I am the operations manager here at what was CCDA, and um, I am a Black man. I have a clean shaven head. I currently have some facial hair, a goatee, and I am wearing a Black shirt. So um, what I'd like to do is go, like April said, through some housekeeping. And um, first, if it's, um, so housekeeping, if comfortable, please turn on your camera when speaking. Please keep your audio muted when you are not speaking. Please use the Q&A feature to post questions. 
The chat feature is distracting for people who, who I'm sorry, the, the chat feature is distracting for people with vision disabilities who, have, who use screen readers. And next we'll talk a little bit about the Q&A session. To ask a question, select Q&A at the bottom of your screen. A box will show to the right, a, a box will pop up to the right and input your questions through, uh, to the webinar, throughout the webinar. And so you can post questions throughout the webinar. And for the Q&A session, um, it will be held at the end of the presentation and the only selected questions will be answered. And let's talk a little bit about the Zoom viewing options. In the upper right-hand corner, select the view for speaker or gallery views. And with the screen share, standard and side-by-side -side options are available. During the PowerPoint, select the view option menu at the top of the screen to adjust Zoom, and ratio, zoom ratio and other features. Also during the PowerPoint, use a slider option between the shared screen and participants to adjust your to, and adjust it to your liking. Um, and let's talk about uh, so for the webinar, the Zoom live captions. Turn on captions by selecting the CC icon. Show captions on the menu bar. Change the size of the captions by selecting the up down arrow uh, to the CC and choose the captions and choose the caption settings. Move captions by hovering over captions and dragging them to the preferred location. Turn off captions by selecting the CC icon and hide captions in the menu bar. And with that, we'll hand it back over to April. Thank you, this is April. Uh, may I have the agenda slide, please? Thank you. So I'd like to review the agenda. We are going to begin this evening with some presentations to ground us in exactly what is business access? What does that mean? And to talk about the role of a certified access specialist or CASP. You're going to hear that acronym a lot and you may have already heard it in the past. And so uh, we have a speaker who's gonna talk about his role as a CASP. Uh, we're also going to hear about, you know, putting access in action and Juan Brelli is going to talk about disability access improvements grant program for small businesses through the city of San Jose. And then following our, uh, our presentations, we are going to have a panel discussion um, and I will introduce uh, each speaker and uh, we will have a discussion about how do we remove barriers and achieve access for all. And then we will move into our question and answer session, which will be open to both uh, presenters and panelists. Uh, we have some questions that were submitted in advance, which CCDA staff has gone through and grouped. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then uh, you'll also get a chance to input a question in the Q&A. Um, and if you're unable to type, you can also voice that. Um, you can use the raise hand function, or if for some reason the raise hand function is not accessible to you, you can voice and staff will help you and we will get your question answered as best we can. And then I will go into thank yous and acknowledgements because a lot, uh, a lot of people were involved in this effort. And so it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our first presenter, Bassam Altwal. Uh, Bassam is a certified access specialist with Cal Accessibility. Uh, Bassam has a master's degree in architecture from the University of Venice, Italy, and he is an architectural designer, project manager, and a certified access specialist. He has over 30 years of experience, including 12 years solely dedicated to accessibility. Uh, Bassam is a code-driven, solution-oriented person in his knowledge of architecture and design. And um, he believes that accessibility and project management can provide the right solution for architecture and accessibility issues. Um, and he regularly is utilized um, in both sides of, of litigation to help resolve complaints. And he has also served as an expert witness in court and technical experts, a technical expert in mediation. Uh, Bassam, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bassam Antwal. I am from a Middle Eastern heritage, 60-year-old um, male, uh, glasses, olive skin, purple t-shirt. I'm going to be sharing my screen and I'm going to be describing some of the pictures on my screen when we come to pictures. Um, so let me share the screen.
Um, so I like to always play, come to uh, start my presentation with this quote from Orlando Batista. It's a great quote. It says, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. This applies actually to, to barriers and um, correcting barriers, removing barriers is an essential part of a certified access specialist. And I will explain a certified access specialist role in a second. But before that, I wanna explain the, um, some differences between the code and the law. The ADA is a national law, federal law, and uh, codes differ between uh, states and also differ between uh, uh, local jurisdictions. So the one important part for um, people to understand, it's the year of 1992. The year of 1992 is when the the law became, the ADA law became implemented. And thus we have, um, sorry, I'm trying to move the screen. Uh, okay, so thus we have uh, um, two, two standards, um, uh, of applications. One is called readily achievable and the other is called safe harbor. To explain it in a fast way, readily achievable is for buildings that have been constructed prior to 1992 and they are required to uh, modify to the best of their ability to the best of the code that they can um, when needed. Safe harbor is for building that applied the code, the local codes and the federal codes after 1992 which if they have applied it uh, correctly, and I'm talking about public accommodation, I'm not talking about uh, any other title of the, of the ADA, just title three, which is the public accommodation. If applied correctly, then they should be okay. Um, there is no such thing as everybody says, as grandfather ruled in that does not exist in accessibility. It does exist when you obtain, when you obtain a permit. Um, so the definition of a readily achievable is easily accomplished and able to be carried out without much difficult or expense. And safe harbor must meet the codes of the time of construction if it's after 1992. Um, uh, some demographic about uh, 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 the use of or the persons with disabilities. Uh, and I, I, will, I put on my screen, um, and later on we could share um, an accessible version of this presentation, um, the um, uh, websites where we get this information. But this information from my personal experience haven't changed in, in 15 years. It's the same amount of numbers, almost, almost same exact numbers. So uh, people with disabilities spending power is around $490 billion. And like one of every five people in the United States has some sort of a disability. That's 20% of, of the population. And 8% of the population are temporarily disabled. That could be uh, a car accident or some, some situation. Um, the spending power is amazing, specifically when we consider that people with disabilities don't go often shopping, for example, by themselves. They always have a companion. They always have somebody with them that they share. So that could be doubled or tripled. Um, so that from 2009, the report from the um, uh, Disability Employment Policy until the figures of 2023, just right now, thank you, Rania, for submitting those figures to me. Um, they're almost exactly, exactly the same. So what the... I'm trying to say about this slide is it's a, it's a, it's a power of purchasing that has to be acknowledged. It's similar to other minorities like the African American minorities and Hispanic minorities. So disability is a minority on, on its on its own. However, the government, other than what uh, what uh, the city of San Jose will be providing you, has a couple of tax uh, that helps out businesses. Tax code 44 on a yearly basis offers a credit. This is a credit, which is almost cash money, up to 50% of what you spend of $10,250, which means basically $5,000 a year are available for tenants 
and are available for landlords to apply for accessibility. Just to let you know, these credits do not apply for legal, like lawyers, but do apply for certified access specialists, do apply for inspections, do apply for fixing. Also, there is um, tax deductions available every year, $15,000. Um, uh, there's a couple of, of, uh, of requirements, but they are very easily met and, um, and really very easy to, to obtain. Just apply them with your, with your, um, um, with your taxes. Um, uh, this slide, it shows uh, a diagram of, uh, and I'm going to read it for you. It, it tells you what we face in the legal departments. I go to court often as a legal expert. Um, the enforcing agency apply what it's called the CBC, California Building uh, Code. But sometimes the California Building Code differs from the federal code. In 2010, we went and kind of joined both codes to be almost similar. But the differentiation of that code could be violating of the ADA, the American with Disability Act. And that violation when you violate the federal code, you're violating the California Civil Code 54C, which results in a lawsuit, which is why California got multiple uh, uh, Senate bills to address this lawsuit. And, and the, they're all joined under Civil Code 55.53. And in this presentation, in this slide, I show a copy of a certificate that the certified access specialist gives to the businesses based on civil code 55.53. And they need to post this certificate once they are inspected on the front door, within five feet of the front door for four months. This certificate gives them legal protection, does not stop the lawsuit, but could reduce the amount of lawsuit to zero money-wise if they fix their uh, property based on the CASP report for uh, within four months. Um, uh, and the same thing, part of the inspection of this uh, slide has uh, a part of what a, re what a report should have. Typically, it should have a description of the barrier, um, should have the code, depends, uh, the code is inserted in the report depending on the legal action or not legal action. Existing conditions that we found, uh, we have to uh, suggest um, uh, implementation of, of fixing the barrier within certain amount of time. And some notes could be codes, could be uh, instructions, could be suggestions of, of how, to, um, how to fix the, the barrier. Um, once the inspection is done via the Department of State Architect, the CASP person has the um, ability to issue uh, a certificate. It's a blue certificate. Uh, and this, there's a picture on, uh, on this slide of the blue certificate and a picture of me giving a lecture on accessibility 12 years ago, holding the blue certificate. Um, it was a different design blue certificate. The blue certificate has a wording on it saying access inspected. And uh, we assign a status to this blue certificate. Um, the business uh, is advised to display it, but uh, it's not obligatory to display it. Every blue certificate is distinguished between um, uh, uh, other certificates by the, only by the number on the blue certificate and the, the letter accompanying it that describe only two status. We have, we could only say two status, either inspected by a CASP, which means your property has been inspected, but it's not compliant yet, or meets current codes and, regu uh, and regulations, which means your property is inspected and meets the, the codes and, and regulation, the current codes and regulation, which is a safe harbor for you for the future. If the business decides to display this certificate, I strongly advise they keep the original in their files and make a color photocopy of the certificate because the sun will destroy it if you put it on your front entrance and it, it, it just will, will disappear, especially every writing on, on, on the certificate. I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, show you some examples and describe them to you of what is very common that we see in lawsuits and we'll be happy to answer your questions later on in the question and answer. Um, it is the tow away sign is actually intended. This is a picture of the tow away sign that people either place on their uh, 
if they're a shopping center on their driveway or by the ADA parking. The throwaway sign has to have certain language and the language will read, I'm reading it now, unauthorized vehicles parked in designated accessible spaces, not displaying distinguishing placards or special license plates issued for persons with disabilities will be towed away at the owner's expense. Towed vehicles may be reclaimed at blank or by telephoning blank. So the very common mistake we see that people buy the sign and they put it on and they never fill the blank. The blank should be filled with a phone number if one inch high and, and the phone number should be there for this sign to be uh, compliant. This sign is actually intended for persons that do not have disabilities to alert them not to park in a person with disabilities. The other very common mistake, this slide will have um, two architectures diagrams of an ADA parking that is a 90 degree and ADA parking that is slanted and a picture of an existing ADA parking that is not compliant. Um, so a very common mistake when, when contractors and sometimes architects design ADA parking is the sizing of the ADA parking. The sizing is typically 18 deep, 18 feet deep, but nine feet wide uh, measured from the center line. However, when you have a slanted parking, the sizing is, is measured differently and it has to be squared. And this is a, an extremely common mistake. And in most lawsuits that I've been involved in, and I could say maybe over a couple of hundred lawsuits, the, the parking comes to play almost every time. Uh, a person could uh, pass by it, see the parking is, is not correct, be deterred and not park there, and that could generate a, a, a lawsuit. Uh, the next slide shows also another parking with, um, uh, with my level put on the parking because the parking should be 2% uh, slope in all directions. It also shows um, uh, a ramp that is encroaching into the access aisle. Um, these ramps used to be compliant at a certain point. They're not compliant anymore. So they, nothing could be within the access aisle other than the writing and the hatching. It also shows an access aisle that has white lines. Access aisle needs to be blue lines on the outside of the access aisle. And uh, it's lacking of a truncated domes, which is the um, yellow bubbly mats that we put on the ground. So a person with visual, visual disability can tap on them and realize that they are crossing into a hazardous vehicle way. Um, so the, a very other common mistake is seating areas in restaurants. 5% of the different seating areas in restaurants um, needs to be accessible. There are certain rules about knee spaces, but what is very common mistake when a restaurant has tables and they have booths that they create a table as accessible, but they don't create a booth as accessible. Unless it's not readily achievable, it's not being able to, 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 uh, to uh, fix. The pictures I have is a sign of accessibility, the blue sign, and um, a restaurant booth seatings where one side of the booth was removed to allow people with disabilities, wheelchair, to be able to slide under the table. And um, that is the easiest solution when it comes to the to a booth. When we have restaurants with different seating areas, different experiences, each experience should uh, should have uh, a five percent seating related to a person with disabilities. Um, please let me know if I cross my line. I know I have only twenty minutes, so I'm going fast as fast as I can. Um, then. You're fine. You have, uh, but so I'm going to say, you have about five, about five, six more minutes. Oh, very good. I only have five more slides, so I, I timed it correctly. Um, this uh, this slide shows an architectural plan of um, of uh, a toilet seat with a wheelchair parked next to it with grab bars to for transfer, and saw so some sizes related to the federal code, which is which declares that the Central of the toilet seat should be 16 to 18 um, from the wall. 
Here in California, we adopted 16 to 18 from the wall for maybe six months. And then we changed it to be 17 to 18 from the wall. So this is an item that we differ from the federal code uh, on it. Also, it shows um, uh, a bathroom. And I'm going to describe to you that the, uh, the restroom, I'm going to describe it to you in a way that almost every item I'm describing is a barrier. For example, the activator of the, of the water closet is placed between the water closet and the wall. It should be placed outside of the wall. This picture showed it placed between the, the wall and the water closet. A person with disability should not reach over a soiled toilet to, uh, to clean their own uh, water closet. Also, a seat cover dispenser is placed behind the toilet, which does not provide a space for somebody with disabilities to be able to reach it. Uh, the grab bars are, are presented on the walls, but the rear back, uh, back grab bar is not centered 12 inches and 24 inches from the uh, water closet itself. Those are, there is a 68 items that could go wrong in a, in a, in a regular toilet. This is a, a, a toilet closet. Part of a lawsuit, the picture has a date of 2011 that I was involved in. Also, uh, after the construction, there's a garbage can placed next to the water closet. After the construction, people could come and bring other items, and those other items will interfere with the clear spaces of transfer or turn around. Thus, the architect, when they designed this, this, this water closet, most likely had the garbage can being embedded in the wall. Um, value engineering, which is a term used by architects and engineers to create uh, 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 least, less expensive items during construction. Most of the time, removing a barrier create another barrier by their value engineering. For example, these guys removed the garbage can embedded in the wall and brought a Costco garbage can and placed it in the, in the toilet, not understanding they just created a barrier for, for, for persons with disabilities. Uh, the next slide shows a door with an ADA sign on it and uh, a lack of signage next to it. There is also a diagram of what an ADA unisex bathroom sign uh, looks like and a diagram uh, of uh, uh, where the signs should be placed next to a door in an architecture way with also uh, some information about the sign itself. However, this slide, I use it for two reasons. Uh, federal code, for example, allows the triangle sign, which means men, and the circular sign, which means women, to not differentiate in color, while California requires them to differentiate in color and also differentiate in the color of the door itself. So a person with um, visual disabilities, from a distance, they, they have some kind of visual, from a distance, they could see the, the sign, but they will think it's only for women because they cannot distinguish the triangle there. And that's the whole reason why California wants the triangle and the circle to be differentiation, and the circle and the door to be differentiation in color. Also, we place a sign with a braille at the latch side of the door. So a person with disabilities has the ability, a person with visual disabilities has to be able to read the braille and, and, uh, and uh, understand what kind of a, of a restroom this is. I wanna also let you know that there's two kinds of brailles. There's the federal braille, I call the federal braille and the California grade two braille. California braille is very, um, it's accepted everywhere. Federal braille is not accepted in California because the spaces between the dots of the braille itself differs. And federally, they're closer, which means a person reading the braille might read the second line of the braille letter and the first line of the braille next letter and confuse them as a, a completely different letter. Um, California is much more advanced in this, in this department. Um, the, uh, Next slide shows an entrance uh, that has a step in front of it, a door with a handle that is circular, not compliant. The door does not have space next to it to open it. And, uh, and this is actually a, a lawsuit. And a small slide shows a portable ramp. 
uh, some of the solutions of an existing buildings, old buildings, on this kind of situations, when the, when the step cannot be removed and replaced with a ramp and automatic door opener, is to provide um, a buzzer and a sign and a portable ramp and change the door handle. So allow people with a wheelchair to access the store from the inside and, and, and leave it. So when they press the buzzer, somebody will be trained. The employee book should have um, uh, instructions how how to uh, how to ac uh, um, uh, assist person with disability into entering and leaving the store. And and talking about the door handle, the next slide shows a couple of different door handle. One is a lever type, and the other one is circular twisting. So the twisting types are not acceptable whatsoever. And um, but however, a common mistake is people will purchase a lever type door handle, but they have a twisting lock on it, and that is also not accept uh, acceptable. And I want to finish. Uh, with one last, I have a huge lawsuit right now, multi-million dollar lawsuit about a door handle that has a deadlock in it, but they function separately. They don't function as a one function. Door handle with the deadlock, when you operate the door handle, should automatically open the deadlock. And uh, unfortunately, the person who suffered a stroke and a 23-year-old girl could not open the door because the deadlock could not reopen and that's became a multi-million dollar lawsuit. It's a $70 fix, might as well go and fix it. But how would you know about all these things? Is by hiring a certified access specialist that will give you a report with pictures. I failed to tell you that in our reports, we add pictures of the barriers found, suggest solutions, which you could take it to a contractor or a handyman most of the time and address those barriers. Said that, I am done with this quick presentation and I will be waiting for the question and answer at the end. Thank you, Bassam. This is April again. Uh, that was very informative and thank you for all the work that you do as a certified access specialist. Our next presenter is uh, Juan Borelli. And um, Juan Borelli is the City of San Jose's Small Business Ally Program Manager. Juan has almost 30 years of public and private sector city planning, urban design, architecture, and building construction experience. And um, he has been in this program manager role for the past 10 years, and he has assisted and guided small business proponents in both English and Spanish with city development permits, inspection processes, and business tax uh, registration requirements. And he serves as a liaison between business owners and the city's technical staff in order to advocate for small businesses to help increase um, certainty and predictability in city processes while providing value-added customer service for small business projects. And uh, one holds a master's in city planning from the Georgia Institute of Technology, a certificate in building construction from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and a bachelor of design in architecture from the University of Florida. Juan, welcome. Great, thank you, April, so much for that uh, kind introduction. So I'm, I'm Juan Borelli, my pronouns are he, him, and I practically have no hair on the top of my head, um, a gray goatee, I'm wearing glasses, and a blue shirt. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk about the City of San Jose's Disability Access Improvement Grant Program, but I'm also going to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the City's Small Business Ally Program. Next slide, please. So the presentation overview uh, is just as I said, and um, I, my last slide is really for Q&A, but it seems like we're going to hold all of our questions until the end after all the presentations and the panel discussion. Um, so I'll also be looking forward to any questions that um, our attendees might have. Next slide. So first and foremost, um, I'll talk a little bit about our Small Business Ally Program and our Small Business Coaching Center website. Next slide. So um, I am the City of San Jose's Small Business Ally. We, uh, uh, up until recently, used to be a team of two for over a million people. Uh, my colleague, who I worked with for the last seven years, accepted a position elsewhere. 
So it's just me currently for the city of San Jose to serve as your point of contact and your advocate to help small businesses understand city processes and then maneuver through those processes. Specifically um, available to help with development permit processes that might be triggered, including the logical steps, the schedule, and some of the associated costs with city permits. Um, uh, I also assist with our finance department business registration requirements. Um, I manage the city's streamlined restaurant program, um, which includes plan review and inspection processes for small businesses because they're some of the most difficult types of businesses to get open since they trigger both city and county health permit requirements. And of course, I also uh, manage the city's disability access improvement grant, which we'll talk uh, about all the detail of which in just a moment. Next slide. Um, we, we do have a website. It's uh, the Small Business Coaching Center website. Um, on this slide in, a, in the box, I've included the web link, which is www.sanjoseca.gov forward slash business coach. Um, this website is set up to help as a guide um, for small businesses to get open as expeditiously as possible. It's a way to demystify the permitting and inspection processes and city business registration requirements um, and has consolidated um, seven different city department websites under its frequently asked questions to try to create kind of a one-stop shop. It's organized around three phases the begin phase, coach phase, coaching phase, and the launch phase. Next slide. And um, on this slide, the, the entire slide is really just a picture of the homepage for this website. Um, so when you go to that website, you would go to the Get Started in San Jose, and you can see that the three phases that I just talked about, the begin phase, the coaching phase, and the launch phase are actually live buttons. So when you click on those, um, it will take you uh, to more specific information and additional resources um, that are relevant to each of those phases. Next slide. Also on this slide, I have a picture of kind of the left-hand resource column, um, which is very small. So um, on the left-hand side of the slide, I blew up some of the most important bullets under that resource column. Um, which is um, different things to help small businesses get open. So there is, through this website, the ability to check your zoning, um, which is always critical. If a use is not allowed, if a bit particular business is not allowed in a particular zoning district, then there's no permit process to allow it. Um, sometimes it's allowed by right, and sometimes it triggers some sort of development permit, conditional use permit, or administrative permit. Um, which would be you know, conditionally allowed or potentially allowed if that permit is approved. So it's ever so critical before you sign the lease or purchase the property to check your zoning. Um, and I can help you with that. That's part of my role. Uh, under this resource comment, uh, column, there's also the ability to apply for a building permit, to register your business with the city of San Jose's finance department. That's applying for the business tax certificate. Uh, but most people in the world call it a business license. So it's the same thing, don't be confused. Um, there's also um, information on how to do business with the city for uh, those contracts um, that the city issues um, and how to apply for different city grants that are available. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the frequently asked questions uh, from the seven different uh, departmental websites that have been consolidated to have kind of a one-stop shop and help small businesses uh, maneuver. We always hear that it's very complicated to find things on the city of San Jose's web websites because it's all broken up by different departments. So anything that a small business might trigger, we've tried to address in the frequently asked questions. Um, again, my contact information is also included on this website. Um, and I always tell folks that if you have questions, if you don't know where to start, if you don't know who to ask, if you don't know what questions you should be even asking, feel free to contact me as your small business ally, and I'm always happy to help small businesses. Next slide. Now let me go into uh, talking a little bit of the specifics of the Disability Access Improvement Grant Program, which is the title slide here. Next slide. 
So the grant, um, as Rania mentioned earlier, uh, was created to assist San Jose small businesses to make in, in, both interior and exterior spaces fully accessible to best serve all of our community. Um, it assists San Jose small businesses to comply with both federal um, ADA and state building code requirements. Um, and then a third goal was really to help prevent those small businesses from being served with an, an accessibility or an ADA lawsuit, which has become quite prevalent throughout the Bay Area and in particular in San Jose. I do wanna highlight the um, Disability Access Improvement Grant webpage, which is um, spelled out here on this slide as www.sanjoseca.gov forward slash ADA grant. So that's the quick link to get to all of the information that I'm gonna to describe tonight. Next slide. So the grant has actually been broken up into two different phases. And the way to kind of understand and clarify is the first phase is um, a credit, which um, you can receive up to $8,000. That's good towards your plan review, your permitting and your inspection fees related to removing accessibility barriers that are identified in that certified access specialist report that uh, Bassam talked about during his presentation. This credit will also cover the cost to hire that third party private CASP inspector to conduct, to conduct that survey and to prepare that, that report. Um, and that cost can be covered when the improvements actually trigger a requirement for a city permit or a city inspection. So most of the uh, types of frequent um, uh, accessibility barriers that Assam described, many of those um, such as door handles, um, the toilet uh, seat cover dispenser location and things like that would not necessarily trigger a permit from the city uh, but certainly regrading the front entrance and um, creating a permanent ramp or installing an automatic door opener would trigger a permit. So those are kind of how we would differentiate whether they would trigger a permit or not um, for any of those accessibility barriers that are identified in the CAS report. Next slide. The phase two grants are a actual reimbursement of up to $25,000 and that um, grant um, if awarded and and small businesses just to be clear you could potentially be eligible for both phase one and phase two grants so we advertise this presentation as you know uh grants of up to twenty five thousand dollars but it, it technically could be the eight thousand plus the twenty five thousand and so this phase two grant is for projects um that would pay for their professional design services, uh, architects and engineers, for example, to prepare plans to remove accessibility barriers that are identified in the CAS report when a city permit or inspection is required. If it identifies improvements that are not uh, requiring permits or inspections from the cities, this portion of the grant will also pay for construction and labor costs to remove those accessibility barriers. So to actually help you make the improvements, um, it'll also pay for uh, purchasing and installation uh, of accessible furniture, fixtures, and equipment. It will cover the cost of the CAS survey and report if a permit's not required, um, and, and the initial ins inspection. And then since the city won't be doing the inspections if a permit is not required, then um, a final CASP inspection after the work has been completed to make the space uh, interior and exterior accessible is required. And, and that cost can also be covered uh, of up to $25,000 um, through this phase two grant. Next slide, please. So we do have some criteria and we tried to set it as broad as possible to include as many small businesses in San Jose um, as possible. Um, the grant is for businesses that are already open located in San Jose with 50 employees or less. Um, and so um, already open is kind of key because um, these are for businesses that might have been approved um, under different requirements that met different accessibility requirements under previous codes, but they've been open for a while. 
And as Basaw mentioned, the code continues to get updated and changed. And so they may be out of compliance, even though at one point they might have been approved and been in compliance years prior when they were originally built or originally improved. Um, they must have a, a valid City of San Jose business tax certificate. That means they just need to register their business with our finance department and have what everyone calls a business license. Um, our finance department doesn't call it a business license because they say it's not a license to do business in San Jose. It's actually an annual tax, a once a, once a year fee that they charge you to um, have your business registered and open in San Jose. The business must be a commercial business, a non-residential property or business. So Airbnbs um, would not qualify, for example, or be a current nonprofit business. Um, so offices, restaurants, um, industrial type uses, those would all qualify. Um, it's just, you know, home-based businesses, cottage food operations where you're cooking food out of your home-based kitchen, childcare out of your home, your primary residence, those would not qualify for the grant. Um, but um, we, we would wanna make sure that uh, if you're having any kind of customers come over to your house that you do um, wanna understand if your home is accessible because we have had actually uh, in San Jose uh, home-based small businesses that have been served with an ADA lawsuit because um, they regularly brought customers to pick up and um, do business um, out of their home office and they were not able to meet the needs of our accessible community. And then if you're a tenant versus an owner, you must have at least one year remaining on your lease. So if the city of San Jose is going to approve a grant, we want you to be around for a little bit um, to make sure that uh, that money is going to good use. Again, very low thresholds for grant criteria because we're serious about really trying to help our small businesses um, meet the needs of our entire San Jose community. Next slide, please. How to apply, you would contact me to start. Um, hopefully many of you will, you know, have met me tonight. And so you would move very quickly to the next step that um, Bassam talked about. You'd select a third party private CASP inspector to come and conduct that survey and prepare a CASP report for both your interior and exterior spaces that identifies all of the uh, required um, accessibility barriers and remediations. You would hire a licensed architect or engineer if a city permit or inspection is required. If you're not sure, you can contact me. I will help you make that assessment to determine which uh, remediations require a city permit and which ones you could just go and do um, and do as quickly as possible so that you're not um, you know, meeting the needs of our community or potentially served with a lawsuit. Um, you would submit a, a complete grant application, which includes a W-9 form, a completed grant application, a signed contract, and your paid task survey report uh, report, invoice, and building plans if a permit's required with the city. All of those forms are on the website, the, the Accessibility uh, Disabled Access Improvement Grant uh, Program webpage that um, I mentioned. Um, and it would also, uh, you would then hire a licensed contractor uh, to actually make the improvements um, if city permits and inspections are required. Next slide. How to apply for phase two grants. You would continue working with me. You may have triggered phase one and approved for phase one grants. Um, we would then look at um, the actual uh, documents to, that would be required to qualify for the phase two grants. Um, that includes the paid design fees if you have to hire a licensed architect or engineer to prepare plans for a permit. Your construction cost estimate, whether it triggers a permit or not. Um, so for, you know, there's a cost to making those changes to some of those frequent infractions that Bassam talked about. Um, the cost for furniture, fixture, and equipment. Um, and then the paid CASP inspection report. Um, if um, phase one city permits and inspections were not covered. Again, that cost to hire that third-party CASP inspector and pre to prepare that report to identify 
that barriers would be covered even under phase two if a city permit's not required. And then the last um, application requirement for a phase two grant is uh, the contractor would sign a form that's called the attestation form um, for required use of prevailing wages. Next slide. So on the web uh, page itself, the uh, Disability Access Improvement Grant website, which is www.sanjoseca.gov forward slash ADA, um, there's lots of additional resources to help proactively answer your questions. My contact information is on there as well, but we've got uh, frequently asked questions. We have a link to the state of California's list of third party private CASP inspectors. So if you don't know who to hire or where to look, you can go to that uh, web link uh, for the state of California for every registered CASP inspector. And it's broken down by different regions and different cities. And you can look at um, potential uh, third party private inspectors to hire to come and survey your space and create that report. The actual grant application and the contract is posted there for your reference. So you'll understand kind of what's included and what to expect. We have an informational flyer handout. We also have included the building division, divisions disabled access requirements handouts that talks about it, what every uh, business and building and property owner should know. Um, the uh, resource links to the, Calif there's resource links to the California Commission on Disability Accesses website, our partner here. Um, and then the actual informational memos that went to the mayor and city council to approve the phase one and phase two grants that um, Rania mentioned is a pilot program. Next slide. And so that's really um, my last slide. I've included my contact information on this slide. Uh, it says questions, but we're gonna hold questions, I believe, to the end. But my website, uh, I'm sorry, my email and my phone number are both included on this site, um, juan.borelli at sanjoseca.gov or 408-975-2655. And then I've included web links again that I've already uh, described in this presentation to both the uh, Disability Access Improvement Grant Program, as well as the Small Business Coaching Center website. And so that's my presentation. Thank you. I'll turn it back to April. Thank you, Juan. Uh, the city is lucky to have you and small businesses are lucky to have you to usher them into uh, helping them be more accessible to people with disabilities. So thank you so much for all of your, all of that you do and all of your hard work. Thank you. And I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be, this is being recorded and we will be posting this on uh, all of our respective social media handles. And we also will be providing a copy of both PowerPoints uh, from Basam and Juan um, shortly to all of the registrants uh, to this webinar. Uh, we are now going to move into the panelist uh, session of the webinar. We have a great uh, lineup of panelists that are going to be answering some questions that uh, CCDA and, and uh, CCDA staff and Rania have uh, come up with in advance. Um, and each question will be asked of a, of, of a specific panelist. And then uh, I, at, at each question, I will read a short bio of each panelist. So the first uh, panelist who I will introduce tonight and ask a question of will be Ali Lopez. And I am going to pull up your bio, Ali. Ali is the founder of Mode Creative Services, a marketing business and lifestyle solutions consulting company. And she is a senior business advisor with Access Silicon Valley Business Development Center. And she has over 30 years of, of knowledge and experience in numerous business fields, such as leadership and personal development, digital marketing, and small business development and management. She's the board secretary of the Filipino American Chamber of Commerce, Silicon Valley, as well as the San Jose Community and Economic Recovery Task Force, among them for many other um, pursuits. Welcome, Ali. Um, Ali, as a representative of the business community, what do you see as the greatest barrier faced by businesses in the city to achieving access compliance for customers with disabilities? And do you have suggestions for how those barriers can be removed or reduced? 
Hi, thank you, first of all, to Rania and CCDA for having me on the panel again. Um, I do apologize, my camera's not working and I've been uh, under the weather, but I'm, I'm getting back there. So um, for small businesses, I think uh, traditionally it's been information or misinformation, as well as finance as barriers. Um, I think the city of San Jose is doing such a great job in getting this information out to people by doing workshops and webinars such as these, uh, working and leveraging um, community-based organizations like SBDC, um, Jesus's um, organization as well. We work with small businesses on a daily basis and we get this information out to them. The importance of not only being compliance, but again, the power of purchasing by those with disabilities and their care providers. Um, I am a mother of a child with a disability, and I forgot to introduce myself as well. Um, I am Asian American, multi-ethnic woman with dark hair and wearing glasses. <laughs> um, but I think when I speak to small businesses, the importance of you know, telling them that it's the law, I think a lot of them kind of shut down and and saying, you know, there's so many things that I have to do. Is this just another thing that I have to do? Um, but I think when I tell them the benefits of being in compliance, that it helps increase your sales, that it opens the door to a whole, a wonderful community. Um, and also I share my personal experiences, like with my daughter, uh, you know, 20 years ago, there weren't air things that I could do with her because of her disability. And there weren't a lot of places that accommodated. Now that she's older, a lot more places are, she's able to go to more places. And her, you know, when she experiences something new at a restaurant, at a movie theater, at a recreational center, uh, she lights up. And I think that's important for small business owners to know, and I do share this with my clients, is that I will be a loyal customer because my child is happy to go to your, <laughs> to your business and that because you are in compliance and you are accommodating them. Uh, I think to reduce um, these barriers, again, getting this information to them, the importance of being in compliance, um, and also this grant that the city has because you know it's not cheap. Uh, but I think the importance of letting them know that, um, you know, I'd rather pay up front for a cast inspection than getting a, a multi-million dollar lawsuit for a $70 door handle that he was sharing earlier. I think the minimum that I've seen from, um, from my experience was $15,000 to settle uh, a case because their mirror was too high. And so... You know, when you share these experiences from um, a personal perspective, they're more uh, open to taking in the information and sharing it in their language, you know, in our underserved communities um, and culturally sharing it, understanding their culture and, and breaking down those barriers. Again, leveraging community-based organizations that work within these communities is key. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Our next question is for Michelle Mashburn, and I am going to read uh, Michelle's bio. Uh, Michelle Mashburn is a small business customer, disability rights advocate, and inclusion specialist. Uh, Michelle is a dedicated disability rights advocate and has played an influential role in shaping a pledge for disability equity and inclusion in Santa Clara County. And she was raised in an environment where her parents owned and operated a small business so she brings a unique perspective to her work and she is committed to fostering equity, uh, actively engaging in uh, initiatives that span healthcare, housing, transportation, disability, LGB, LGBTQI plus issues and disaster response. And Michelle emphasizes the in, in transformative potential of prioritizing individuals lived experiences as a powerful force for positive change. Uh, welcome Michelle. Um, I'd like to ask you, as a customer with a disability, can you share with us what you believe are the most common barriers faced by people with disabilities in accessing businesses in the city of San Jose and any recommendations you would like to offer to address these issues? Thank you, April. Um, I am a white woman. I have glasses on, graying hair. Um, I'm wearing a gray turtleneck and behind me you see a screen thing. I can't remember 
what it's called background zoom screen background um that has all things disability on it uh, so as a i am a wheelchair user as well and i also have uh i'm on the neuro divergent spectrum somewhere in multiple places. Uh, so for me, the architectural barriers that I encounter are frequently, it's more than just architectural barriers. It's also, you know, the, which are the easier ones to talk about, the architectural or the easier ones to talk about parking spaces, especially van accessible parking spaces. Because as a newly purchased wheelchair van user, it's, hard to find those spaces uh, within the city, um, especially at smaller businesses. Uh, steps that go into main offices, you know, into the office building without appropriate signage that directs you to where the wheelchair access is. Um, heavy doors, narrow aisleways. Um, and what's mind boggling to me is going into a Target or a Walmart and them not having a cart that I can use by carrying it around a hand basket cart that I can utilize to be independent. They expect somehow as a wheelchair user that I use their you know, big cart and that just isn't gonna work. It's not safe for other people and it's not really safe for myself. Um, one of the largest things is inaccessible bathrooms though. Oftentimes because we're dealing with a limited space in, you know, especially with small business owners, it's important to remember that functional access is still essential in what you're doing. And with functional access, it's like, don't store things under the, the specially designed counter space in the bathroom that allows a wheelchair user to roll under it, unless you're adapting it in a different way to meet the needs of the disability community. So those are some of the, um, you know, some of those very important things. Other things though, deal with people with other types of disabilities. And I reached out to the systems advocate with Silicon Valley Independent Living Center today to also kind of crowdsource some of these other needs, um, such as have a QR code for your menu so that somebody can access it and blow it up with their telephone or their iPad. You know, having accessible tables in restaurants is, really important. Having accessible tables in um, pop-up markets is also really important, which the city is still working on. Um, so these are all very important things. And the thing really with this, the other things are attitudes. When a small business reacts with fear, which is a common response because of how much the lawsuits are kind of, the risk of a lawsuit is huge. But most people with a disability would much rather sit down and help you change it or find a way to create that access together to support each other as opposed to blocking it. So the attitudinal barriers are not doing training with your employees, negative bias and assumption, um, unwillingness to provide reasonable accommodation. And that fear response becomes an exclusion response as opposed to an invitation to learn together. And that's what nine times out of 10 I'm seeking when I encounter a barrier and I'm like, can I speak with somebody about this barrier? Because oftentimes it's reusing space that was there for design there for a reason, but that reason wasn't shared and that knowledge hasn't trickled down. The thing about making your stores and your businesses accessible is you also create opportunity and you create opportunity for even your employees. You create a safer work environment for your employees. And those are the important elements to kind of remember in remembering accessibility, um, you know, ways to address. I, I am a big advocate of the yardstick because that's 36 inches. If you walk around your store or your place with a yardstick, you've got 36 inches of clearance very quickly and very easily. Um, training, improve your signage because signage is important for people with low vision and or other disabilities that if I don't know where I'm supposed to go, I all I see is the barrier, I don't see the access. So the sign alerts me that there's something different. Consistent signage is also important. There's a reason why the signs are a specific way. The colors are important. Don't make a special fancy sign because you think it's special or whatever. 
crowdsource it, figure out what the community wants or needs and what works and what doesn't work. So those are my basic, um, that's my basic answer to that question. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm gonna be mixing things up a little bit in the interest of time so that we have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Um, my next question is for Jesus Flores. Uh, this is April, by the way. And um, welcome, Jesus. I'm going to read your, your bio as well. Um, Jesus is the president and CEO of the Latino Business Foundation of Silicon Valley. And since 1998, Jesus Flores has been a cornerstone in San Jose's small business community, initially, initially aiding over 100 businesses with relocation during a downtown retrofit. And um, in 2002 alone, his efforts impacted over 1,700 businesses, strengthening San Jose's economic landscape. And he was also recently named to the National Small Business Association's Leadership Council. Welcome, Jesus. And my question for you is, you know, uh, as a representative of the business community, what misconceptions do you believe are held by people with disabilities about your access efforts? And how do those misconceptions affect businesses in the city? I apologize, my mute. Uh, thank you very much, April. Again, my name is Jesus Flores. I am a uh, Mexican uh, man with uh, brown hair, uh, brown skin, and I'm wearing a, a blue jacket over a uh, uh, shirt. I um, again, I want to say thank you first to for the great information. Thank you to to Rania, to the city of San Jose, the CCDA, um, to Basam for the great information, and also to Juan. Uh, for always being supportive to our small businesses, as well as Ali, Ali with all of the support that they provide to small businesses as well. I do want to say thank you again to Michelle for the great information. I think she, she has uh, many of the answers that we were looking for. She mentioned about attitude from small businesses. I think that is a great, great point to talk about that because uh, there has to be an understanding uh, between, between small businesses and obviously our um, uh, people with disabilities. Um, I think that the uh, one of the biggest misunderstandings is that small businesses don't really want to understand or they don't care about understanding how to meeting these uh, different needs of people with disabilities. Um, we do understand that these needs are not just uh, about getting into the door uh, but also getting like understanding, like he was mentioned before, um, how to easily read information or the use of technology. I really like the uh, the, the uh, comment from Michelle when she mentioned about QR codes, great information. We, we're making notes on that and uh, accessible tables. Um, we believe that this misunderstanding, believing that small businesses are not um, do not want to understand all of that might even make people with disabilities to less likely to visit these businesses. And this obviously means less customers for our businesses. And we know that that's not at the end what we want. Um, even though small businesses often have a limited money, this is something that is very important to understand, limited money. And also there are in, in all buildings, we really try to meet these needs and keep uh, getting better. Uh, it is important to, to clear up that uh, this misunderstanding. We can do this by showing people that we have already done everything to be accessible or also working and uh, communicating. And, and again, in order to, under, in order to understand these, uh, these needs, I again uh, believe that uh, Michelle had the uh, best comment by saying the attitude of the small business being open to 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 work to talk to the uh, to the people with uh, disabilities to better understand those needs is probably the key the main key uh, obviously the support from uh, programs like the city of san jose um, uh, disability access improvement grant i mean this is great support great help for our small businesses Overall, we understand that making our businesses more accessible is, is, is good for everyone. It's, it helps our people with disability, but it's also good for businesses as, as 
Yes, I also make a note, as Vassan mentioned, 490 billion in, 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 in expenditures from, from uh, people with disability, that's a lot of money. So we do understand that they're also customers uh, and we are working on doing that. We're working on having a better communication, understanding those needs and, um, and being more accessible for business. Once again, thank you for uh, the opportunity and thank you, Michelle, for these great, uh, great comments. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to uh, turn it back to Michelle Mashburn to round out uh, the last question uh, before we go into Q&A. Michelle, by the same token, as a representative of the disability community, what misconceptions do you believe are held by members of the business community about your access needs and how do those misconceptions affect members of the disability community? Um, so my answer on this one's a little bit shorter, which is probably good. Uh, disability is not rare is the first one. You know, there it's it's deemed that one in four people have a disability. And when you add in complex medical or other medical issues like high blood pressure, things that impact our daily life, that number can be higher, even though it's not counted in many places as higher. Also, accessibility does not have to be ugly, expensive, or inconvenient. Um, but a lack of planning for accessibility is what will make things worse. Setting an intention of inclusion will make it accessible by, by that overall plan, as opposed to being afraid, being afraid, which I understand the fears, but that fear response can actually exclude people with disabilities. But it also goes beyond just physical access. The disability is very community is very diverse. Um, and while physical accessibility is a good start, there's also technological needs, programmatic needs. I went to a Adobe thing recently and it was not planned for accessibility. So it's like large business, small business, this attitude is the belief that we don't exist, I think, creates a barrier where we may not expect it to be. Um, we're also not incapable, uh, you know, which is often sometimes a perception that if you're a wheelchair user, somebody may talk to the person with you versus talking to me. I had that happen today at a, at a store. Um, you know, overall, the other thing is disability is not an issue to hide. It's not something to put in a closet. It's something to be talked about because by talking about it, by talking about it and including it as a business decision, you remove that marginalization that happens from our society to start with because we've all been fed that, you know, disability is other, it's somewhere else, it's not in our room. And then once it happens in our room, we have to struggle doubly hard to kind of meet the needs that we learn we aren't met as easily. But that misunderstanding is important to, um, to start the dialogue. And I'm hoping with the Office of Disability Affairs, with the city's uh, disability affairs officer, with more events and more planning, we can bridge these differences and kind of connect more people around the shared goals that we have, which is prosperity and creating a healthy San Jose for everybody. Um, instead of also, instead of placing the burden of accessibility on disabled people, we can share in that struggle and, and make things accessible overall. Thank you, Michelle. We are now, I, first I wanna thank all of the panelists for your insights. And uh, now we are going to move into the question and answer portion. And I'd like to introduce Michelle Davis, who is the supervising architect uh, with the Division of the State Architect. She joined DSA in, 20, in 2022 after serving as a uh, DSA subject matter expert for over a volunteer for over a decade. Uh, she's a cum laude graduate of UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design. And she has enjoyed, Michelle has enjoyed a wide ranging professional career. And she has consulted on accessibility issues for small business clients, as well as larger multi-facility owners engaged in new construction, planned alterations and burial removal undertakings. And uh, we asked her to be here because she frequently consults with the CCDA on our technical manuals. And she's a good, uh, wonderful friend and colleague of mine. And so she will be, uh, the, the question and answers uh, will be directed towards uh, Michelle and also to any of the presenters and panelists. 
And um, we received uh, quite a few questions in advance. And so we're not gonna be able to get to each question tonight. So what I did is I, um, I'm i going to uh, choose the ones that I think are the most broad. And uh, for some of the more specific uh, ones, um, you may need to contact Juan or Michelle or the CCDA, and there will be a slide at the end where we'll remind you of how to get a hold of all of us. So the first question that we received quite a few questions about uh, businesses maintaining their access being here this evening, and uh, we have now returned to the recording. And um, I want to remind everyone that all of the copies of the slides, um, as well as the information about the uh, City of San Jose's grant program and other resources will be sent out to all of the registrants. And um, if we could actually put up the, the, the slide that talks about uh, the resources, that would be great. We'll do that very quickly. So the CCDA has quite a few resources on our website. Uh, we have several ADA primers um, for small businesses. We talk about effective communication, service animals, frequently asked questions. Um, is there a next slide? Um, we also talk about the, the tax incentives that Bassam mentioned. And we talk about how to find a certified access specialist in your area, as well as some quick tips. Uh, for how to be accessible to people with disabilities for businesses. And we're always happy to be a connector uh, to all of you. And I just wanna take the time to thank uh, those individuals and organizations for making this evening's event possible. I want to first and foremost thank uh, Rania Mosin uh, just for your commitment to your community's business and disability communities and your leadership in this effort. You know, Rania is, uh, I find her to be very approachable and very kind, and uh, she's a wonderful colleague and someone who really um, is someone who really championed uh, the programming that we're bringing to you tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Phil uh, on our CCDA staff, as well as our captioner, ASL interpreter, and our Spanish language interpreter. And I want to thank all of our presenters and panelists as well as the California Business Properties Association. Uh, the California Business Properties Association is a strategic partner uh, for all of our regional listening forums. And we will be hosting similar uh, webinars and in-person forums throughout the state of California over uh, the next year. And I also want to give special thanks to our California Commission on Disability Access Commissioners for your support of our community outreach efforts and local partnerships. Uh, so with that, uh, I always like to end these by, by challenging us to, when we go back to our communities, what's one thing that we're going to do to help increase access in our community? Um, and so think about that. Think about what, what's one thing that I learned tonight that I'm going to apply to whether I'm a representative of a business community or a representative of the disability community or a mix of both. How am I going to be a champion? Because accessibility starts with us. And all of us have the ability to increase access in our communities. So thank you all for being here today and uh, have a good evening. Can I make one suggestion? Oh, I, had problems, I had problems signing up. And luckily, I got, uh, Michelle Mashburn helped me out with this, which is great, but you may want to take a look at your uh, sign up portal. I appreciate that. Thank you. This is April. We'll, we'll, we'd love to hear from you about that. I'll talk with you offline. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.